G'day guys, it has been a freaking long time, I'm, uh, I am sorry. Uh, for those that don't know, I've been working at Vintage, uh, long story short, I've always been working at wineries since I left school, um, or truck yards in the Barossa Valley. Vintage is a busy period, basically the grapes uh, get picked, brought in, we gotta crush them, and uh, it's a 24-7 operation, so, um, yeah, I've been doing 12 hour shifts, six days a week, flat out, I only get sad days off, um, and just, you know, doing the usual stuff around the house and, and just trying to catch up on sleep and whatever else. So, I know heaps of people have been messaging me asking what's going on, uh, like I am all good, so I appreciate the people uh, reaching out. But yeah, we're back into it, uh, and this is an exciting one that a lot of people have been waiting for. Uh, yeah, this one's this one's freaking cool. So let's just get straight into it because I know a lot of you guys have been waiting for this video. So here we are. You back at Lewis Engines. You know what that means? Hey, you majestic fella. You miss me? Yeah, it definitely looks like it. <laughs> here we are, guys. Back at Lewis Engines. All right. So. Uh, Darren's just with a customer. I don't know if I'm allowed to film in here. Pretty sure I am. But um, we'll say good day to Darren in a sec. I have got here earlier and spoken to him, so I haven't just busted into his shop and helped myself. So uh, yeah, we got a few things ready for the budget RB30 build. As most of you guys would know, that's what we're doing here. Um, we've got a bit of a plan together for some other stuff as well. So anyway, let's get into the RB30 budget build. We have. Uh, the pistons and rods here, I believe last time we were resizing some other rods that were standard. Uh, so Darren's going to complete doing that and we're going to film the process of, of um, how he does that sort of again. We kind of went over it a little bit, we didn't show you the finished product because we're putting ARP uh, rod bolts in it. So yeah, we'll do that on uh, the last one that Darren does out there. Um, he's, yeah, like I said, he's got some customers so I don't want to interfere too much. But what I've got to do is, i pretty much got to do this. Take the piston off the rod. Um, there's little circlips that hold them in. And I'm going to show you guys how to do that. Darren has done this first one uh, and shown me because, like, yeah, we can rip them to bits ourselves, but doing it the right way is, is another thing without damaging stuff. So uh, these we're not using. They're obviously going in the bin, I believe. And yeah, so pop the uh, circlips out. And then we're just going to knock, uh, knock the gudgeon pin, I believe it's called, uh, knock it down so the rod can can fall out and leave it, leave it half hanging in here. Because I don't believe which are. Oh, no, we don't we don't have to do anything else. I don't think. Anyway, we're going to find out. Darren's going to tell us. We might just go say hello real quick. Go, Darren. Oh yeah, going, man. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't want to interrupt you with the customer, so um, yeah. So we're back with Darren, guys. It's an exciting, uh, exciting time, that's for sure. So last time, Darren was resizing these uh, these rods, so we're not going to annoy him. He's going to get stuck into that, and we'll uh, we'll get these circlips off the the gudgeon pins, aren't they? The gudgeon pin, yes. Gudgeon pin. Awesome. Oh, and we got the block back in the hot bath. Um, because it has been a while. <laughs> yeah, clean it up a bit. Yeah, so we got it cleaned up and uh, that'll be coming out. Rods will get resized and then uh, we'll go through the whole process again. Yeah. Let's get into it, eh? Thanks, Mark. <laughs> okay, so circlip pliers, as you can see, they've got little prongs on them. And uh, all we're going to do is obviously go into the two holes there. Hopefully, you guys can see them. So always make sure you're wearing safety glasses doing this because these can fly out. Uh, so you, you compress the spring and then you got to get a pick in there. I've got to, sorry guys, I can't show you on camera because I've got to get this little sucker. I'll use this end actually and, um, and get in underneath it. And it just pops out like that. So Darren also told me that uh, these circlips have got a rounded edge on one side and then a flush 
machine surface on the other. So um, it's going to be very hard for you to see that on here. So long story short, the rounded surface has got to be against the gudgeon pin and the flush side has got to be on the outside. So um, he told me a bit of a theory about it. I'll get him to tell us again as to why he does it that way. So anyway, now that that's out, uh, what we're going to do is just slowly tap against, um, sorry, not that side, <laughs> slowly tap against this side without hitting the circlip uh, until it comes all the way down to where it is there. So um, I'm just going to do that now in between my legs because that's a soft vice. There you go. And you kind of feel the pist uh, the the rod drop. So it hasn't come all the way just yet. A little bit more. There we go. So there you go. It's pretty simple. Leave that hanging in there. We're gonna go along and do the rest of these. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty simple, easy process. Okay. So they're all done. Uh, always make sure you. Yeah, account for all your clips and whatever else, they're not mine. That stuff's not mine. But uh, yeah, you don't want to lose anything, so. Uh, yeah, that's all done. We'll go see what Darren's doing now with the rods. So Darren's just told me I need to clean up uh, around the, the ringland area a little bit more. So I'm just going to go through um, and use a razor blade just to get any chunky bits out. I don't know if you can see them on the camera, but it's pretty scungy in there. So I'll go through, clean them out a little bit before we uh, put the rings, the fresh rings on it and size them all up and whatnot. So, so yeah, because obviously we're putting new uh, rings on these pistons uh, and yeah, you don't want anything, especially in the way of all the oil galleries there. So that's the most vital one. Obviously it's all got to be clean, but yeah, just do what we can. So, um, what have we, we've done a lot of cleaning. So the block's all cleaned up. Um, pistons are cleaned up. So just remember guys, they're second hand out of this block RB30 pistons. The block is obviously um, completely factory. All we've done is clean that up. Oh, you you decked the head, uh, the top of the block, didn't you last time? Yeah, just yeah. machined it flat on the top. Yep. Um, so now Darren's you got to explain what you've done with these rods because yeah, so um, after we put it, <laughs> <laughs> after we put the bolts in we've resized the the tunnel yep so now what we're doing is we're checking the um, vertical bearing clearance so we use a ACL race um, standard size bearings yep because the crank still measures standard um, so then I've measured that with the mic then I've transferred the inside of that to this mic Okay. And I smashed my dial the other day. <laughs> Something fell on it on the bench. So yeah, Mr. Toyo inside Mike with a, a ball uh, end on it, which is more accurate for to control the way the anvil goes into the um, the diameter you're measuring. Okay. It's a new style. Well, it's not new now, but it's a rather than the old um, curved feet style rest we used to use. This is a round style thing. It's a bit more accurate for measuring. Yeah, right. So what I've done is I've um, bolted the bearings into the rod and tensioned them to uh, 54 pounds. Yep. Then I've got my size on here. and um, So you obviously put that in there. Yep, and that is a bit under two and a half thou. So, so we've got the five there, and each each stroke is a half a thou. Uh, each small, yeah, each, each stroke is half a thou. So the big long stroke is one, two, and then the half. So you've got two and a half on the plus side of the dial, which is clearance plus. It's um, bigger. Okay. So, yeah, two and a half. Do you guys thou. understand that? <laughs> two, two and a half thou bearing clearance, which is nice. If we had, if we put that together and we had four, then that's not good. We don't okay. want four and we don't want one and a half. So we, two and a half is a good, for that diameter bearing journal, with this style bearing, with what the motor's going to um, go through, two and a half is good. 
So is that a factory spec or is that more of a, your uh, knowledge? Yeah, just a thing over the years of just messing with them, seeing what works and what doesn't. And, okay. Um, yeah, like in a factory thing, they'll have a tolerance where it might be, um, you might measure that, it'll have between one and a half to three clearance. And yeah, and in a factory setup, like from the from this end, that might be two thousand clearance on that one, three on that one, one and a half on that one. They're all over the place. Um, but fortunately, when this and ground these cranks, they're very accurate on the journals, and um, not a lot of crank grinders can reproduce the ac accuracy between journals as Nissan did. They've done a really nice job on the crank sizing. Like you measure that, and it's not even a tenth of th tenth of a thousand different on each journal and which is handy when you've got a crank in such good condition and we can polish it and use it again and we can work around that instead of regrinding it and then having to change tunnel sizes to get clearances and things we can it's a little bit easier when you've got a nice crank to start with yep so yeah to um, that's how we measure the clearance on that so now what we'll do is we'll take these shells out and we will balance the rods end for end Okay. Yep. Cool. So they're all done? Resizing of the that's, rods? Yeah, that's happy now. That's yep. nice. So my tunnel size that I resized the rod to, I'm happy with that now because I've verified it by measuring my clearance at two and a half. Yep. And I know my inside tunnel diameter is around three tenths bigger than bottom size. So they, with that tunnel size of the rod, they'll give you a, a tolerance of um, bottom to top size, which is about a thou. So you can mess around with that sizing. Um, it's nice to keep on the small size because then the bearings have got a lot of crush on the on the shells. And this particular tunnel size that I I, I sized it to was uh, a couple of tenths above bottom size. So um, it just nicely worked out. Everything's that's just part of blueprinting the yep. motor. When you're machining things, you can juggle a couple of tenths here, half a thou here yep. and there, and you can get it how you want it. You know. And that takes a lot of time. Yeah, so, but you've time, yeah. well, obviously only got one here that you've done, but you've done all six. Uh, I've done all the six. The, all the rods were done to that size. Yep. I took a bit of a gamble and thought I'll finish them at that size, and luck prevailed. That <laughs> that, that tunnel size was nice. <laughs> so yeah, awesome. I, I've done a few of them anyway. I sort of know. <laughs> yeah. I've only done a couple hundred, so I sort of know. Cool. And obviously, that's not going to be something you can do at home. No, I know that's got to be done in a machine shop. That yeah. rod resizing and the uh, fitting of the bolts. Sometimes what I've done in the past, to, if I'm doing something for myself and I'm trying to save time or whatever, I'll, I'll put the bolts in and then measure the inside of this. Yep. Sometimes I've pulled it off where the inside tunnel is usable. Um, but normally they've got to be the caps got to be cut down and then the inside tunnels will be resized on the machine. So. But yeah, it, it, sometimes if you want to put the bolts in and check it, you can get away with it, but it's... You're yeah, better off to bring it You're better off just down. machine it straight up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's go balance these rods. Yeah. So as you can see here, Darren's got a nifty little alley vice that he chucks the rod in. Yeah, and it just holds it nicely. So you don't want to um, like stick it in a vice from there. <laughs> and undo it because it's going to move the, the cap and things around. So um, even if you had two bits of wood in a vise, yep. like two bits of thin stuff, clamped it up and undid them, you know, that's fine. But it, yeah, I mean, these are a couple hundred bucks, but wood in a vise is the friend. Have you or seen Soft it? jaws in a vise is even better. Oh yeah, true. Some, some vices do have aluminium soft jaws on. Have you seen a few rods rock up with uh, some teeth marks I've in them? I've seen teeth marks, man, <laughs> yeah, on the side. Yeah, I've seen all sorts of things, uh... yeah. But they do move around, and when you undo this, uh, the cap locates on a on a shank on the rod bolt. Um, idea is when you take it off, put it back on, that goes back on exactly the same. So this is still round. Ah. And um, some rods are really bad for that. Um, it just depends on the hole in the cap. If the if the hole is big and the cap straight on, chances are when you do it up, it's going to be out of shape again. So you've just wasted the whole time of resizing <laughs> that nice because it's out of shape. So there is a few things to check with that sometimes. So what's your favourite rod? Uh, rod brand. Oh, rod brand spool. Spool. Yeah, I like them. Yeah, good value for money, good quality, perfect. 
Oh, yeah. I always use them. Because you, you would have seen every rod under the sun, eh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is dearer ones. There's a real nice uh, Wasco Boost line or something they call it. Yeah. Boost something. And that's a nice I-beam rod. Um, but, yeah, expensive. But if you've got that <laughs> sort of motor, you need it. Yep. But for this type of engine, just putting a better bolt in. Because that is the main failure of the Nissan motor is a rod bolt. Mm, the yeah. quality. As I so learned the hard way. Put the better ones in and <laughs> best money spent. Yep. Yeah, I reused an ARP yeah. on the RBM3 and yeah, we had a failure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got to watch out with the highly stressed engine. Yeah, because you got to stretch them. you got to, you got to stretch them to their tension, so you'll measure them with the uh, stretch gauge. Oh. So that... There's points on there that go in between the bolt. You see on the bolt, there's a, a, a oh, yeah. little divot there. Yep. And on the head. Ah. So that'll measure the length of it. So what you do is you um, measure the length before it's got tension on it. Then you torque it up to spec and see what it stretches to. Yeah, right. That's it's that simple. How you check it. So then what you do is if you've got a set of bolts in a motor that you're, that you're pulling, pulling apart all the time, the motor, so you write, you write down... Um, what it started that? What you stretched it at, you know, at that tension. And then the next time you go to rebuild the motor, you tension it up and it stretches to nine thou or something at the same tension, then you can throw that bolt out. Wow. So that's sort of how you can prevent rod bolt failure by checking with stretch. <clears throat> yeah. Far out. But these, two, these are. Um, do, you, do you bother with them with standard yeah, rods? Yeah, really, really high performance motor I'll do. Um, but you, you can't do that with standard rods, could you? Like rod bolts or... No, you no. need the ARP with the, yep. the, the special holes in them. And those little points, they fit in, the, in there nice. So then you can measure the length. Oh, dear. Oh, and, and, you know, it'll, when you, as you do it up, it, it's, yep. it goes longer. It stretches. So, yeah, usually ARP, like with these, the, these type of bolts here... Yep. Um, they'll give you the... Do you know how much one of these gauges are? Yeah, I think a couple hundred bucks. Bolts will tell you, they'll tell you to do them up to that. Oh, yep. Like they'll give you a foot pound reading to do up to. And if you go on their website, that bolt part number will um, tell you this. Well, there's a main stud instruction. I don't even know why that's in there. Oh, okay. So they, that's. They not... give you the same sort of thing when you buy the rod bolts. It's always in with the. Yeah, with, yeah, with yeah. The, um, lube. It's, yep. in, it's in the packet with them. And they tell you the tension to do it up to. Um, so you, without checking the stretch, you can. Just do it up to their tension and it's bang on the stretch yeah on the first use of the bolt so when you're rebuilding that engine and you want to keep an eye on the rod bolts condition you'll make sure it's not stretching any any further for tension so there you go so there, hey. yeah. i didn't even know that <laughs> when, that's awesome you know thousand horsepower motor or something you've got to keep an eye on that otherwise things will come out yeah, well, I just got a blanket. <laughs> I got a blanket rule now that I just change the rod bolts every time change I rebuild it. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. A, a cap screw bolt, like an ARP two thousand. Yeah, I if think you, if you rebuild the motor, it's cheap insurance just to replace them. Yeah, I think I use. Are they six two five? Is that what they? Oh, six two five. Yeah, six two five is a real high quality. Yeah. And there's a H eleven, and there's some. Yeah, there's some other real exotic bolts. There's a lot of different brands. Yeah, I know they're expensive. Yeah. <laughs> they can get, yeah, some of them can be 100 bucks each. Yeah. But, you know, if you've got that sort of motor. Yeah, and you want it to last. You've got to keep it, keep it up. You've got to do it. Okay, so now we're doing the uh, balancing of the rod. Yeah, so what I've done is I've set the jig up. Yep. In the other video, we explained how to set the jig up correctly. So I've established that this big end is the lightest one. And then I've zeroed the um, the scales. Yep. So the tape's just there to stop this from moving because every time you take it on and off, if you bump this, it changes all your setup and you're back to square one again. So I'll find a nice even spot there where it goes back in the same position. And that there is my spot where it's going to fit. I'll just move it up and down a couple of times to stabilise it. So that's 478. So this one here was 476.4. And this one's 478.2, so we've got to take off two grams off this big end. And how do you do that? Just on the linishing belt. So we'll just, uh, we've got a rotating linishing belt, we'll just grind off on, on the ends here. Yep. Just in a nice spot, so that, I mean, you wouldn't want to go and grind here or anywhere. 
and you don't grind here because you want to grind as far to the end of that rod as possible. Yep. And uh, most of the meat's on here. A lot of rods have got pads on here where, where you can grind off the balancing pad on the end. But the Nissan ones have got these ribs here, so you just sort of grind it off smoothly and then deburr it on the sides until you get them all the same weight as the lightest one. Yep. And then we can do the small end. Sure. Yeah, just sort of make it as neat as you can. And then what, oh. the, what the killer is, if you're doing this job all the time, and then you put a new belt on there, <laughs> oh. it throws you out. Or when the belt gets old, you go, I've fucking been taking grams off here, and it's not doing nothing here. And you go, what the fuck? So there's another gram to come off. I mean, a gram's fuck all, really, when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, true. But now we zero up. Now we're right. Oh, righto. No, I didn't zero up. Oh yes, yeah, so and then you know how far away you are. Yeah, so you put that one on and it just tells you per grams of how much heavier it is. So 1.3 grams heavier, oh, so yeah. it's easier to tell yep. them. Then you're not thinking of that figure of the lightest one, you're just yeah. going to zero. <laughs> In the previous video, Darren set this up and he explained um, how this side of the rod takes the weight. So you can just balance one end of the rod at a time. So then he'll, uh, he'll 180 flip that after he's done one side of the rod, and then you'll do the other. So as you can see, it's a pretty tedious. Yeah, so that's 1.2 grams, and now we've got half a gram to take. Yeah. So what do you get them in? Like, you don't, surely you don't go within a gram. I mean, within point, point one is nice. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, there's, a lot of people say half a gram, but I mean if it's accurate, repeatability when you're putting rod back on and it's nice and accurate, 0.1 of a gram is okay. Some rods are really bad, like they uh, must be the, the lengths of the rods and the way this fits into the diameter and that. I think if the closer you can get this to size here, yep. the more accurate it is, it holds the rod better each time when you're taking them on and off. So a set of rods I did the other day, I had a lot of trouble with them. They were not uh, repeating every time I put them on, I get a different reading and it's driving me crazy, yeah. I've, I've got them in the end, but the, these the, these Nissan ones are nice because I've made this to fit here. <laughs> yeah, fair yeah, enough. It'd be nice to have a mandrel to fit each rod, but it, sometimes you've got to work with what you've got to, you know. Yep. Yeah, I've got majority of the sizes, but yeah. These ones I was doing with big truck things, like a diesel thing, and they were hard to um, get them to sit on the mandrel properly, yeah. A workshop working with the Hoi Bubba guys. Yeah. You'd be yelling right now, calling them over. Have a look at that. <laughs> look at the dot. Oh, don't blow on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Sometimes Nailed you know, it. Sometimes lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so that one, that one was, you had to take two and a half grams off, eh? Two and a half, yeah. This one here is 3.8 grams. Jesus. Heavy. Yeah. That's crazy. I had some rods the other day that were 20 grams different. What? Mm. So for instance, four grams is a teaspoon of sugar. That doesn't make any sense. Or does it? Yeah, that's pretty much useless to anyone. Anyway. <laughs> cool. So now you set it up the other way, that's the lightest. Yep, that's the lightest one. And you zero it. Yep. And then you, and you just do down. it all again. Let's tell you how many grams off it is. Yeah. So yeah, one point one point one, one point two grams. Heavier. Cool. And then where do you take it off from? Uh, just just off the end there. Just grind that off. Yep. Just with the lynching belt. Cool. So you look at the end of it and you go, you don't if if some rods are real thin here. They might have a bit of meat up here, so you grind more off the thick part of it. So, yep. So you don't change the strength. You know? So as you can see here, guys, these have uh, had a bit of weight taken off of them, and so that side of it, sort of, you know, that half of it is good to go now. Darren's just doing the other half, just to make the rods uh, as even as possible. Done the balancing on the rods, so. Um 
probably didn't see this in the movie, but what I, what I did check first of all was if these um, small end bushes were worn out. And they're um, perfect, just like the day they were made. Like there's <laughs> probably three or four tenths clearance, maybe half of their clearance there, which is perfect. Um, so we don't need to change them? No, we don't need to change them. They're, they're perfect. They yep. do wear out though, like in... in, in my, but these Nissan engines are so good here. I don't know, they just last forever. I don't think I've ever put bushes in, yep. in a Nissan rod in a small end. But you can press them out and put a semi-finished bush in and then hone it back to to size if they're worn. Sometimes if the engine uh, is under a lot of detonation, that bush will um, hammer out and sometimes the bush will um, um, lose its crush and come out of the rod. Yeah, wow. And then you're in the shit. But the um, generally these factory ones are always spot on. So now we've got to weigh these. So we've got one clip in each end so we can weigh them. Got to be very careful in here. <laughs> <laughs> There's always something lying around, man. So we'll get this. Uh, we'll take these and we'll, bat, we'll weigh these. Yep. Get make sure they're all the same weight. They're probably going pretty close, but like yeah. a forged, forged set of pistons, you might get them half a gram out of out between a set. Yep. They're pretty close. Same with the H-beam rod. Um, most of them are within half a gram. That's why I like using the small ones because the balancing is really accurate on them and it saves me a lot of time. Because they're always spot on. And come around this side. Yeah, let's see what the weight is. And we haven't got one clip in either side, but we're only going weight for weight on each one. Five oh what oh, Jesus, it's five oh seven point nine, five oh eight. Five oh eight point one. See they're within point two of a gram already, that's from the factory. Five oh yeah. seven point nine. 7.9, see, see, that's good enough. Actually, better than aftermarket forge pistons. Yeah, <laughs> they're all within 0.2 of a gram. Yeah, don't touch them. Unless we did, no, we didn't. We might have, we, we, we must have. No, because I, I think we've ground off them though. No, because I we only did. just knocked the rods out. Yeah, we didn't, so. no, we didn't touch them. That's how they are from the factory. Oh, yeah, hey, look at that. Wouldn't get that with a 2J. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think these pistons here are made. <clears throat> Yeah, at Sugi. See in the piston, the genuine Nissan pistons. At Sugi. Yeah, right. It's a Japanese um, forging plant or you know, casting plant that makes the stuff for genuine Nissan back in the day, like through the eighties. They they still do make uh, pistons now. Yeah. Yeah, right. Oh, there's a bit of a there's a war going on at the moment. You don't know about Darren with the the RB. And, I'll take them. Oh, the You're RB right. and the versus the two J. Yep. Yep. Oh, Ryan, we'll be going forever. Yeah. <laughs> so what we've got here is the Hastings ring. Yep. And the uh, genuine RB30 piston is about the only piston that the aftermarket people uh, service a, a ring set for. So if you've got a RB20, RB25 or 26 factory piston, there's no aftermarket ring you can buy that'll fit them. You have to use the genuine Nissan ones because when they make them, so this is a top ring. What they do is they change the depths of the ring grooves. So to check the, the depth or the back clearance, we put the ring in the wrong way around. You can see that it's lower than the surface of the piston. So it's got clearance behind the ring. Ah, uh, okay. That's called the back clearance of the ring. So the manufacturer builds that into the ring when they make them so a genuine Nissan ring a uh, genuine Nissan piston the the back the groove depth is uh, different to the aftermarket stuff so you, that's why you have to use the genuine Nissan rings in 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 all the turbo stuff but these RB30s they uh, Hastings do a replacement ring set so just for instance like these ring sets they're about 120 130 bucks yep Whereas a genuine Nissan set of rings for a, like an RB26 or a 25 are about, about 400 sort of thing, Jesus. 380, 400. Um, Far out. These are a cast iron second with a molly top ring. So they've got a molly denium. Oh, um, we won't be able to see that. Little remember. impregnated into the ring. So they got a groove in the outside of the ring and they pour this molly, molly uh, product in there for better sealing and better 
bedding in and stuff. But the factory Nissan ring runs a a Nikon. Um, uh, it's a, a real high quality steel top ring with no molly. So gener generally, you would use the high quality steel ring in something that's really high boosted. Because what happens when the engine's under detonation, this molly uh, feel in the ring can shake out and then the rings won't seal. So if the engine's getting a lot of detonation or whatever, that, that molly will, um, will give you grief. So generally don't use a molly ring in a real high boosted thing. Mainly use the um, high quality steel Nikon ring, which all the CP pistons come with. Um, once again, I get them from Spool because I like using the uh, the Nikon ring, the high quality steel ring. But with this particular one, we're sort of stuck with these. But this is not going to be highly boosted like no. some of the other things. So that will work, you know, in this 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 one, no problem. Because it's a budget build. Yeah, yeah. So what have you got here? You've got uh, what? Obviously, there's a lot of rings there for the people that don't know. Uh, yeah. So there's a an all ring. So the all ring runs a three-piece oil ring so run this waved uh, piece we won't put them on but that fits in there and then you've got the rails which basically the rails hold the ring in place yep so you've got a rail on the top and a rail on the bottom three-piece oil ring and then you have a second ring and um, that's usually just a cast iron um, ring with a usually got a chamfer on the inside which tips the ring up. I think we explained about the ring seal and design in another video, I reckon, previous. Um, and then the top rings. One just we just a, talked about. Yeah, yep. just cast iron with a molly coating on the front of it, molly impregnated on the front of it. So we're going, we're installing these rings now? Uh, it, what we'll do is we have to fit the pistons to the rods. Oh, yep, yep. First. And then we can... I think the first thing to do is we'll put the crank in. Yep. So we'll wash that cradle and then we will bolt a set of main bearings in and measure the clearance on it. Yep. And then if we're all good, we can fit the crank and set up the thrust. End oh, play on the thrust. yeah. Yep. Cool. Yep. The end float and that. Yep. Yep. Awesome. All right. I'll go clean that yep. uh, girdle up. All right. So what are we up to now? Yeah. We'll check this main bearing clearance. So we've got to do with this, these cradles is we tension this down and I always put a bolt here because if you tension that down and that's sitting up I have broken these before and that's the end of the block <laughs> so I always put uh, one either end like the, when I'm checking the, yep. the, the clearance so um, with these Nissan blocks I pretty well know that all the tunnels are within two tenths of a thou always they're perfect whatever machine they use is far better than any machine we've got in the automotive trade um, so uh, yeah put the, the bearings in here and tension this up to 38 foot pounds yep and um, now we can measure that that clearance so I've measured the uh, the crank and I've transferred the measurement onto the mine oh okay so you put your micrometer on the crank yep on, on the mains on the front one yep and same deal the mains in between Darren doing all this I'm cleaning bolts and doing other sort of stuff but yeah, just so you guys know, Darren is uh, quite a few steps ahead of me. <laughs> so that all these main journals are spot on in size, the same. So, so we're checking just one because these are all the same size. Yep. And hundreds of these I've done, I've never seen a factory tunnel unless it's overheated or um, the bearings are spun in the tunnel. I've never seen them that they're out at all. They're, they're, they're spot on. Um, so this type of build, that's in our advantage. <laughs> Bloody we don't want to go machining them for, you know. So what we've got there is two and a half thou clearance. Is that good, bad? Yeah, perfect, yeah. So Perfect. Yeah, and, and these generally work out like that on the mains. They're real user friendly. Like, um, So a factory bearing would have probably one and a half thou clearance. Yep. The ACL H series bearings usually run an extra thou. They're built into the design of the bearing. Um, but two and a half is perfect. Like if we had three and a half or four thou clearance, we'd we'd be grinding the crank. You know, like if we're getting super fussy. I mean, the engine will still run with that much clearance and have enough oil pressure and, and whatnot. But 
when you're getting super fussy with it if you want two and a half hour clearance that's a nice all round figure to have you know so just lucky that this works out that that way here which is ideal so for people that don't know if the clearance is too low and or too high what actually happens uh, yeah if the, if the clearance is too small what will happen is the um uh, the bearing can touch the the crankshaft and because the crank will move because the crank sits in in that void and it's surrounded by a, a barrier of oil and um, if if that clearance is not enough as soon as something flexes and the journal comes to the bearing and hits the bearing that's why you'll get all that black on the bearing and the and the overheating will eventually the bearing will um, just spin in the housing and it's all caused from um, usually the crankshaft touching the bearing which can be not enough clearance or out around tunnels um, bent crankshaft too hot a oil temperature uh, incorrect viscosity of oil for what you're doing with the motor yep someone's running like a 5w40 in a 800 horsepower engine well they're gonna have trouble with one one and a half hour clearance they're gonna have trouble you know like there's a lot of theories going around with bearing clearances with viscosities of oil, but I'm a big believer in two and a half to three thou bearing clearance with a, a racing 50 weight oil, something like a Lucas or a Redline 50. Yep. Which a turbocharged motor that's making sort of um, 60 horsepower per cylinder, 80 horsepower per cylinder, which is sort of, what's that going to be, 300 rear wheel kilowatt style thing, which every day now is pretty basic, that will need a good um, a 50 weight race oil in it. Um, a lot of people say it's too thick, but the thicker the better when it's red hot, you know, like yeah, the, yeah. you know, if you, even on a street motor in our environment where we, we, we've got to have a, a heavier viscosity oil because of the temperature of the, the weather, you know, the, yep. the oil temperature is going to be higher. And so the other way, so if your clearance was too high. Clearance was too high. Um, engine will still run all right. There's more move. Some particular motors, like a, a real high performance, high horsepower engine, you sort of got to design clearances into it so things move and don't cause problems. Yep. So you will run unusually large clearances on things to get that to survive in certain places. Um, but what will happen, say, with one of these, if I had 4th hour clearance, it'll still run. It won't knock, it won't do anything silly, but it'll still have oil pressure, but it's sort of already done its limit in its use, and it's only going to wear from there. Yeah, okay. So, you know, you sort of don't go... It, I'm, I'd rather... I'd rather... If, if anything, I'd rather see 4th hour clearance here than 1.5. Yep. Um, but, yeah, it, we've got 2.5, so that's that's ideal, really. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So now you're happy to put the bearings in? Yeah, so what I do is I just got this wax and grease remover stuck okay. in my container with <laughs> pink tape on it. And um, I just give the bearing a quick wipe over. Even though it's clean in the box, you just always like to wipe them, you know, like. Yep. And just clean hands and you're just wiping, looking, making sure there's nothing on there. Yep. And this has got to be dry. So I seen a guy on YouTube the other day who was assembling a motor and he put oil on that. Oh, really? And I put the shell in and I went, man. <laughs> That's good work, but yeah. So is there a specific way of pushing these in or anything? Yeah, you, you want to um, find the, the tang yep. and put it in just underneath the tang like that. And then you just put your finger on there and just push on it really lightly, just very slight pressure and roll it in. Cool. And push it so it's even. Don't want to... Oh, I've seen people hitting them with hammers and all sorts of things. <laughs> Plastic hammers, I've seen oh. Yep. Cool. And then the middle one's a different looking bearing in The middle one's a thrust, yeah. Yeah. So the middle one, as they call it, a K mounted flange. Don't know how that comes to be. It must be a K shape that mounts the side of the flange to the shell. Yep. And it's pretty crude how it fits in, but they've been doing this for years. That just fits in there. And that side controls the end float yep so for people that don't know what end float is uh crankshaft movement yeah in and out so you've got to have a 
probably around about three to five thou is nice. On some race motors with real heavy clutches, you tend to want to open up that end float a bit okay. to get more oil in there to take the load when your clutch is on. Um, you know, some guys that are real heavy on the clutch. Um, so with a like drift engine, which yeah, you know this might be used in. With the RBs, I've noticed that about five, six, seven thou end float is nice. Yep. Um, definitely don't want to set it up tight with the clutches like a twin plate or something. You you need at least five. I'd say minimum five. Yep. Um, five to seven. Some I've run anything up to ten, twelve thou, like clunk, 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 like that. You need that sometimes to. Um, get the oil in there to control the load. Yep. So the oil will come from here, it will spill over the side, and it'll run out of that groove, and it'll fill that face. Yeah. So right. all your load from your clutch is pushing on the back. So you see some motors where all this is chewed out. Yep. Sometimes what happens is there's a lot of load on the on the clutch, like there's no free play on their slave cylinder push rod or something like that. It's constantly loaded. So it's as if their foot is on the clutch all the time. Yeah. Uh, I'll push it on the crankshaft and damage the the thrust face. I've seen that quite a bit actually. A lot of I've seen a lot of problems with the um, slave cylinders that are mounted over the over the, the gearbox spline. Yep. They run a spring to return the the um, the thrust bearing and it seems to put put load on the crank. And yeah. Yep. Yep. I've yep. Seen a lot of problems with that. Um, so we're going to look at how to measure the thrust. Yeah, we're going to do the end yep. So another thing, I don't like to use this assembly grease on the motors because sometimes the motor will sit around for a while and, and the oil and the grease can evaporate. And I've seen some molly-based assembly greases. Uh, I've seen one particular motor once. It, it was left for quite a while and the, and the grease dried up and it went real pasty and it um, actually chewed up the bearings. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, I just like to use this sort of thing like that Lucas assembly lube. You can buy it either in these bags or um, you can buy it in tins. It's, a, it's yep. a real syrupy stuff. It's real, real good. It, it'll, uh, like it's real sticky shit. It'll just yep. hang onto the bearing and it won't evaporate. Yeah, right. Because yeah. I use the red line. Red, red line doing assembly yeah, lube. Yeah, it's like a I red... I use the engine straight away though, so it wasn't. Yeah, if you're using it straight away, you don't have to bother. Some of these motors will sit for a bit, you know, like yep. say a guy's doing a motor and restoring the car, um, has to have his motor before it's painted or something like that, some people. <laughs> yeah. And it'll sit around, you know. But yeah, generally wipe that on there. Don't have to put too much on, just. Just enough to keep your crank happy. Yeah, yeah. Just on first startup. Usually the Nissan, like if you lightly grease the pump gears, they'll basically get oil pressure before the engine fires up. They're yeah, pretty, they're pretty good. Cool. So now the crank's ready to go in. Yep. Do you want a hand with that? No, she's got one. Oh, <laughs> I picked it up the wrong way. <laughs> Typical. So that's all clean. We cleaned that before. Yep. We've got to put those screws in. Yes. But we can put them in in the motor. Yep. feel it it's pretty pretty good you don't have to put this on do you no no i'll, I'll just check this half first i always like yep. to check this up and see where i'm going yep it gives me a bit of an idea see i could feel that clunking away so what's that we got is that four thousand i reckon it's about four in it close yeah so if we give that a whack with the Bit of soft stuff either end of the crank, we have five or six. So these ACL H series bearings, they look ugly. I've had a lot of people. Yeah, I was looking at them going. And they rang up, are you serious <laughs> with that? Yeah, but that's how they are. They're a yeah. flash coated Babbitt bearing. And um, these aren't the new ones you're talking about. No, 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 they, no these no. are the old H series. Yep. There is a new Calico one now, which has got the graphite Calico coating on it. Uh, okay. And they're a bit different in the design of the, the backing and the, the layers. Because they run a steel backing and then a couple of layers. Yep. And then they put the babbit on top. But the um, the new ones are a bit different design. I'm actually going to start using them a lot. I fitted some to a motor the other day. And they're really nice. Like 
um, the calico coating, the graphite, is a bit forgiving on the um, initial startup and stuff. You know, it's got a bit of a protective layer there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're good. Now, these um, bearings, you have a top and a bottom. Yeah, that's right. So, yep. the top uh, the uh, top bearing always works as the motor sits. So, that's the top half. Yep. Um, they're fed with oil through, so they'll have an oil hole and a channel. Whereas these ones, the bottom half, are um, uh, there's no hole. So the, the the and these reliefs here just allow the oil to, because most of the loads here. Yep. So that is a leading groove for the oil that allows it to flow into that channel better. Okay, cool. Um, there is a, a type of bearing which is a fully groove bearing. They call it, which has got a groove all the way around. Yeah, I reckon that's what I put in my last engine. But there's weaknesses with it because you lose um, a load bearing. Well, maybe that's what I pulled out. Is that what they are standard? Um, I can't remember. No, no, the general Nissan NDCs aren't, aren't, aren't fully grooved, no. But I don't like using the fully grooved ones because uh, it takes away a lot of the bearing area. So your loading's less because you've got a groove there. you only got little bits either side taking yep. the load. But that's why on the RB26 they run a, an annular groove behind the shell which feeds either side of the bearing from behind the shell. Um. Nice setup. Can do it on the RB30s, I've done it before. I've, um, I've got a tool that I've made up that I, I put a channel in the in the back of the bearing and then uh, drill a hole on the other side of it to feed it. I've done that before um, for people with RB30s, but uh, normally, um, Normally, if you get that serious, you sort of stick to a smaller motor rather than the... Because the, the 26s and that, they've sort of got some nice things about them for the high-end motors, you know? Yep. With the stroke and the uh, smaller stroke are better, it'll hang together, and the, the, the design of the block with the oiling is better on the 26, you know? Yeah, well, a guy I used to work with had a good saying for that. He said, we're building a race motor out of a town carriage. <laughs> <laughs> I used to like that. That's a good saying, I like. Uh... The old the town old, carriage. Yeah, out of a town carriage. We're, we're designing a race engine out of a town carriage. Yeah, the old That's town carriage, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to go in there. Yeah. I feel pretty useless just watching. Oh. I'm like everyone at home here watching. <laughs> yeah. So then what I do then is I get a bit of this assembly grease on the threads. Yep. And just wipe a bit under there. Because if the head, of, that head of that bolt is actually turning on here, so when you're talking it, if that's dry, you actually think you've got four, uh, forty foot pounds, but you haven't yep. because there's there's force on it stopping it. So if it's sliding and moving, there's a pro tip. That's a trick. You had to build a grease. Is right. I mean, ARP lube. You can use ARP lube as well if you want to put that on there. Yeah. Yep. I mean, you put ARP lube on a rod bolt because that's what they tell you. Yeah, um, and it comes with them. And it comes with a nice bag of it. Without the cradle on, we've established we've got five thou end float with the top thrust shell. Yep. With, with none of this on. So now we loosely <laughs> put this on because um, the top and bottom half with those ends of the thrust uh, flange, they can be misaligned because this doesn't have any dowling. Nothing locates it. It's a bit of a crappy design. There's some motors that have got dowels that locate the thrust, which are handy, but these don't have it, so you've got to mess around on assembly a bit. So you bolt that loosely down um, because it could be sitting to one side and you tension it up and the crank won't turn. That, that's pretty common. So we just got to make sure that we've still got. Yeah, we've got in float there, still see. So that's where that main cap is pretty well wants to be so we'll, we'll do that down at that and hopefully it doesn't move see the cap moving down as I put that bolt down there yep terrible design thing but once they're bolted down that tunnels machined from when it's bolted down so if you took this girdle off tipped it upside down put a straight edge along the, the, the bases it's like this yeah so it relies on being bolted bolted down to be uh, when, when the factory machine it so if you're going to line bore one of these, you have to fly cut the block side of the parting line, not this. This is an easy one. So I hit it first up. 
lucky. So we've got five there. So yeah, we want to bolt that cradle down there and... Uh, Happy days. Yeah, it's great because normally you've got to mess around with them. <laughs> <laughs> normally you have to screwdriver this, undo the, all the bolts and screwdriver this around or hit the ends with something light, you know, like a yep. uh, bit of wood and you hit it to compress the flange. Sometimes you have to mess around like that. Sometimes you even have to take the thrust bearing out and rub it on some sandpaper. Jesus. And on, the, on a flat bed, you know, on a flat surface. And I don't like doing that, but that's the last resort. But if you've got to have end play, you know, you can't have it tight. So the dead giveaway is if you assembled that and you weren't checking anything, now the crank's tight, now it won't turn. You go, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> it's usually this is bound up because of the bottom, the crank turned when we didn't have this on, then we bolted this on and it went tight. So that means that this thrust flange is sitting either forward or backward and it's binding up all the crank, stopping it from turning. So if you put that in the engine, it'd probably tear up all that thrust bearing and probably, probably wouldn't get to the dyno. Far out. So now the torque settings? Yep, uh, 40 foot pounds. Yep. 38 to 40 foot pounds. And I just, what I just do is I just nip them down all even, like start from the center and work to the out. Yep. It's not real critical, like you wouldn't tighten that one down and then go to that one. Yep. That's a bit silly. So you just work outwards. Usually got these on an engine stand, but all the engine stands are full. <laughs> Got a bit of work on. Oh yeah. So when you're tensioning, like you don't want to do this with the wrench, tensioning it. Yep. You want to get like a 90 degree or perfectly. Yep. Like standing like that's a bit silly. But if you get exactly 90 degrees and keep it at 90 degrees when you're tightening it, that's makes it easier on your arm and that's the right way to do it. And then so you what know. I do when I go through my sequence, let's check it again. Because uh, foam mold rang. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's come in and talk to me. And then I've forgotten where I am. Another good way to do it too, so you don't forget, is um, on talk to yield bolts. Sometimes these are like a talk to yield where you'll set them at 20 newton meters plus 90 degrees. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you want to sort of go, oh, which one did I do? Where was I? So I just get a, a white pen and. Um, I just mark all the bolts, so I go like that across them. Yep. So they're all that way. When 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 they're at their first tension, 20 newton meters. Then I've gone 90 degrees, and that comes around. Yep. That way, then when I go here, and I go, oh yeah, I haven't done that yet. Yep. Then I I know. But these are straight torque down. But if you're doing a torque to your bolt, it is handy to put a white line on them. Saves the day sometimes, you know. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, that turns nice still. Look at that. If you could turn it like that, because that that assembly loops pretty thick and syrupy so you get a bit of resistance with it yep that's what I don't like using the greases because they give you a false when you're turning it by hand the grease like, feels tight and you think something's wrong so if you use that that's probably the thickest assembly lube I'll use that Lucas stuff it's, you know I, I've gone away from the greases we used to use them years ago but I'm not, not a fan of them so then just finally uh, once that's bolted down check it again to for good measure. We've got a good five to six there, so happy to happy to put that in. Awesome. Yeah. So if we had three at this point now we'd probably put something soft either in and just tap it yep. to seed it. And then we'd end up having five. And then we're happy that's going together. Awesome. Halfway to a bottom end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing you need to make sure you do is put the, you can't actually see it in there, but the little, I'll let Darren explain this bit. So it'll make a hell of a lot more sense. So you can see there, there's no grub screw in the, the oil gallery. So yeah, just, is that what it's called? Oil gallery, yeah, where we drilled it and tapped it. We yep. got rid of that, uh, what, that aluminium uh, bung thing from the factory. Yeah, that's right. Just so you can clean it all out. these quarter screws in, just to, not too much Loctite because it can run into those holes. Yep. So you imagine what Loctite's going to do in there. So give it a good nip. And 
and wipe it off. And what I do then is I just get this chisel, not too sharp, but and I'll put a couple of dings on there. Just so it can't undo itself, sort of. Yeah, thing. it won't, but uh, I don't know. Some some people like to use the the ball peen of the hammer. Yep. And just peen it over on the outside. Um, but if you're ever going to take these out after the red Loctite is really hard to take when you undo them after. Um, yep. It's impossible to get them out, so you don't want to go doing too much to it because you never get them out. Like if you peen them over too much, it won't. You actually have to drill that peen off the top, so your plug will come out. So yeah, you know, I just a couple of little little marks around there just to see them in place and. Uh, yep. That's all you need. It's easy to do it with the crank in the motor because uh, it's sort of holding it for you. And the bench <laughs> is sort of chasing it around the bench. Jeez, that spins good. Beautiful, isn't it? Mm. That's what I mean with the factory tunnels. How nicely they're machined. Old Nissan got it right, eh? They did. They did a real good job of that. Uh, whatever machine they used. I'd like to have a look at it. <laughs> There's no automotive machine that can get it that accurate, but my brother-in-law does have a real nice machine that he's designed that he can tunnel bore stuff within a tenth to two tenths accuracy. Bloody hell. Mm, it's probably the only decent machining setup in Adelaide that you can get a tunnel machine really nice. And a lot of people use line honing machines. Yep. It's pretty ordinary if you really measure them and you're really fussy. They do an ordinary job. <laughs> you can't beat the line boring with a tip tool yep. for accuracy. Alright, so we're pretty well out of time. So just to give the guys a heads up of um, basically what's next, I guess. Put the pistons on the rods. Yep. And uh, check the ring gaps. Then we can put all the pistons in the, in the bore. Awesome. So these are right here. You want me to pack them up, or uh, no? They'll be right there. Yeah. Yeah. I can work down that in. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Better to leave them all there while they're all set up. Yep. Yep. All right. Is that going to be right on there for now? Yeah, that'll be right. Yep. No problem. It's all clean in here, no dust. And cool. Should be good. So there you go, guys. The bottom end is uh, halfway there, pretty much. It's pretty much like the next bits. Relatively simple, isn't it? Well, I'm, I don't yeah, know. I'm, I'm gonna learn anyway. Pistons <laughs> on, yeah, by the time they're in, check ring gaps. Yeah, it's just all very time consuming, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of the stuff is cleaning and oil pump we've got to work out what we're gonna use here. So, we're, oh, yeah, we're yep, probably, um, we don't want to use the RB30 uh, style pump, so we'll probably go to a turbo RB25 or RB26 style pump or an N1 or something. Pretty sure I got one. I might home. have something lying around. Yep. I reckon. <clears throat> but 100% do not use the RB30. No, pump. no, 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 no. The the spur gear pump and the the brake straight away, like on a RB30 single cam engine. Yep. Um, people rev them five and a half, five eight, and they'll smash the gears. So yeah, don't use one of those. <laughs> uh, so I think yeah, we'll find one of them. You you've probably got one around. And we'll, yeah, we'll I'll check definitely that out. would. Definitely would. Measure that up and make sure if we've got one with billet gears in it, even better. Yep. I probably wouldn't use a new N1 pump with a factory N1 gears. No. I probably wouldn't. I'd tend to get a 25 or a 26 housing that's not scratched up, measures up nice, and put a billet set of gears in it for this type of build because that is the problem end here. Yep. So if you spend a bit of money here, well, we have we've put the um, yeah collar on. Do, and, that's a must. Yeah, do yeah. do this stuff this end, and that solves a lot of a lot of trouble. Yeah, just keep the RPM sort of. And you can buy billet down. gears from you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I've always got them. Yeah. Yeah. They're actually made here in Adelaide by a local machine shopper. Um, yeah. Right. Fabrication guy that I use that makes uh, that welds my sumps for me. He um, the shop he works at. Have a CNC machine, and they make the oil pump gears here in here in Adelaide. Yeah, right. So that's another reason why I like using them because they're local made and they're good quality. And we'll be getting a set of them too, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we better unload the Ute because we have another little surprise for Project you. Project on the go. Yeah. <laughs>
So we'll go do that before we pack up, I guess. Knock off, yeah. Yeah. Bloody hell. Well, thanks heaps, Darren. No, that's right. No this is freaking wicked. That does turn nice, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Even so, with that sticky leaf on. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys do have any questions, chuck them in uh, in the comments below. Uh, anything you want Darren to answer for the next video, so I can go through and um, and hit him up. Because yeah, these guys they've been you guys have been hounding me like crazy for months to hurry up with this, but. Darren's been flat out since the video, well, he's always been flat out, but the video sort of gave him a bit of a spike as well. And then, um, obviously, me doing vintage, it's not easy for us both to get a day where we're free. A lot of time, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be spending a lot more time down here soon. Yeah, <laughs> there's always some engine to build, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm. Uh, no, nah, awesome. Let's go and load the Udo. No problem. So, I brought the Neo with guys. So, uh, between Darren and myself, we're going to build this bad boy up. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to explain anything about what we're doing, but Darren's already noticed there's a couple of little issues here. Uh, the old block off at the front is wrong. Is that correct? Yeah, on a Neo it should be a block off rear with the restrictor at the front. Yep. I mean, it's not really going to matter in oil flow, but if you're starting from a, a fresh one, you always have the hole at the front. But yeah. It's but anyway, just being fussy. Yeah, just looking at and trying. To... <laughs> but this one's still 86 mil bore. That's so, a standard bore, yeah. Um, yep. We're not going to explain what we're doing just yet because that's, yeah, that's the next project. We'll sort of <laughs> so I brought the head, everything, crank. Um, yeah, we'll tell you guys about that another time. But for now, I'm going to drop it off. Oh, has it got the collar it's on? It's got a collar already. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, because I've got it done at Remax. Beautiful. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That saved us a job. Yeah, got it lineaged, all that stuff. And yeah, that doesn't look too bad on the journals, eh? It's actually done two years worth of work. That's good. <laughs> whatever, whatever, you, whatever oil you're using, whatever tune, or whatever tuner you're using, take them out the tea. <laughs> we'll take the tuner out the tea. We'll keep using that oil. Thanks, Gia. <laughs> Spot on, man. Bloody oath. Awesome. That's great. I can't wait to see what we can do with this. Anyway, let's get it in here and um, call it a day, eh? That's it, mate. Thanks, buddy. No problem. Appreciate it. Welcome. And don't forget, guys, hit us up in the comments if you want to ask Darren a question. He's yeah, uh, no more than happy to help. Anytime. Wicked. All right, guys, we'll be back very soon for the rest of the RB30 build. <laughs>